Sometimes when we read through the Bible, we notice that the word God is used a lot. Uh, however, this word God did not necessarily ap uh, appear in the ancient languages. So it really helps us to get an understanding of the words in the Hebrew and Greek behind the word God. And Exodus chapter 3 is a perfect place for us to examine this topic and learn a little more about how to interpret some of these ancient passages. So join me in this episode of Bible Scribe. I am Bible Scribe, and I am dedicated to bringing you simple and honest study of the Bible. I have studied a large body of works from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the early Christian writings. I am a technology professional, and I bring an analytical approach to the studies that we will do together. If you have been discouraged by the many voices telling you what the Bible says, stay tuned, because we will break through the noise and get to a plain understanding of the things of God based on the scriptures. Thank you for joining me in growing closer to Him. Let's get started. Good morning, guys. You know, sometimes I like, you know, I feel close to you guys because you watch my videos, and uh, sometimes I want to be a little vulnerable with you. Uh, you know, sometimes I don't have everything together. Um, you know, my setup is is low budget, low cost. I, I do it, you know, the what I do, I try to do for speed so I can, you know, I spend the majority of my time on my research and the production of my videos is uh his really low budget and low key and that's just because that's the only way i personally can produce the content uh in a way that fits with my life schedule and uh you know gets it out to you guys in a way that you know hopefully is at a quality level that helps us all understand what we're we're um, we're studying but you know I, I don't have a set i don't have you know lights camera action you know, uh, you may wonder why um, Why does Bible scribe have his hair spiked up? You know, why does he sometimes wear a hat? Well, it's because I'm, you know, I'm going bald. <laughs> I'm getting to that age, you know, and uh, it, it, by the way, if you didn't know, for men, uh, spiky hair is the new comb over. I <laughs> just... Just want to make that clear, you know, to those who may wonder, you know, why are all the guys out there either bald or they have spiky hair? Well, it's because, you know. Anyway, there's that, and you know, um, something that's uh, started going on in my life, just personally, I've uh, committed with a friend to read through the Bible. Uh, he wants to get it done before Christmas, and we just started a few days ago. So I'm in the midst of reading through the Bible, and our goal is 24 chapters a day. I will say this has been, uh, even for the first few days, been challenging just to put together the time to get through those chapters. However, we're, you know, our goal is speed here, so we're trying to go through these chapters as fast as possible. Now, this friend of mine, he is um, one of my best friends. He is, uh, I've tried to get him multiple times to come on and do a show with me, uh, for for the channel, but um, uh, you know maybe that'll happen in the future. I'm still trying to get that to happen. But um, so we are reading through the Bible. You know, I encourage you to join us in that if you want. Um, I'm not going to put together a program that we're following here on the uh, YouTube channel, but um, I'm just you know putting that out there to say you know it's something I'm committing to. 24 chapters a day. I'm currently in the Book of Exodus. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to do that type of thing as well in your study. Just a fast read through. Even if you're not like grasping every detail, sometimes just going fast helps you get a different perspective. Okay, You may feel like you're missing things, but it is so valuable because you're moving so fast, you're seeing the overarching concepts throughout. Okay, So there's just different ways of reading through the Bible, and this is one that most people neglect. A quick read through to get just overarching concepts 
and again re-familiarize yourself with where things are located in the scriptures and what the sequence of events is. So, uh, and and part of doing that this week, I obviously I just mentioned I'm in Exodus. Well, I just read through Exodus three again and remembered that this is a concept I wanted to make a video out, and this is that video. Exodus 3, uh, the interaction between Moses and God in the, in the, in the event of the burning bush, uh, that's what Exodus 3 is about when God commissions Moses to go back to Egypt and face Pharaoh and deliver God's message and be part of this event, the sequence of events that would free the Israelite people from the hand of Egypt, okay? This chapter has so many different references to God and Lord and these different English words that it, when I first studied through the Hebrew of this chapter, I was amazed because there's so many different words in the Hebrew being used that are all translated as God or Lord in English. And so this helps us understand the uh, nuance behind. We're going to go through this passage together. I'm going to show you these Hebrew and Greek words from the Septuagint and the Hebrew text. And we're going to get a better understanding then of what each of these words means. And it should shift your kind of perspective of these interactions between Moses and this burning bush event and God himself. And it also will give you a greater understanding of the way that the people in Moses' time saw these things, the, the way they interpreted these experiences. We, okay, because the Hebrew language particularly gives us insight. Understanding the words in that language gives us insight into the way they would think about these things or feel about them. So this, to me, is... It was a super valuable exercise when I first did it, but now I'm bringing that to you. I wanted to be able to show that to you. So, so you know, put on your thinking cap because this is going to be a little bit of a detail and nuanced study. And I will admit right off the bat, I don't have every single answer about the ancient language of Hebrew right. But then again, as I've studied other scholars, they don't either because it's such an ancient language. Uh, we know a lot. We, there's a large portion of the understanding of that language that has been, exp, you know, uncovered, but it's still, it's so ancient. Uh, the same can be said with ancient Greek. Um, modern Greek is different than the ancient Greek of the time of Christ, and there's still nuance there that we don't fully understand. Even the, the highest level of scholarship doesn't understand because it's such an ancient language. And it's not spoken that way anymore. In fact, if you just do a little research into Greek, you'll know that the, the scholars don't really know how to pronounce ancient Greek. Now we have uh, probably a closer pronunciation by the Hebrews because their nation uh, culture has preserved that language. It's probably still not the same as the way ancient Hebrew was spoken exactly, but it's probably pretty close. Now, uh, again, the Greek is, uh, is harder for us to know exactly how ancient Greek was spoken. That's why you'll see different English spellings of Greek words by different scholars, because they each kind of interpret the, the uh, intonation, the speaking of those words, a little differently. So their transliteration of that word in English is just slightly different. I'm speaking a lot of nuance. If you're interested in this stuff, this is going to be a great great video for you. Now, I wanted to start with a little background just so you get into the feel of where Moses is, what's happening in this time period. So here's a map of the Sinai Peninsula, uh, the Red Sea, and that whole area. Now, uh, ignore these little markers uh, for the time being, I just wanted you to see in the Sinai Peninsula um, that this part of the Sinai Peninsula that I've circled is essentially the wilderness of uh, the Old Testament of Exodus, where the Israelites were wandering, right? Uh, and 
I wanted you to know too that this area over here in Arabia was considered Midian. And this is where our story in Exodus 3 occurs when Moses sees the burning bush. He's in Midian. He has escaped from Egypt and traveled all the way out here to Midian. And that's where he found the well and the Midianite women. He took a wife. And now he's shepherding flocks of Jethro in the plains of Midian. And that's in the area I have circled here on the right. So I hope that gives you a little context for uh, where Exodus 3 occurs. Now, to expand on that just a little before we get into the text, I thought this was a good map I found of what I believe is the true route of the Israelites after they escaped from bondage. Now, remember what I just said a second ago, that this area over here in Arabia is what was called Midian at that time. So this is where Moses uh, was tending Jethro's flocks and saw the burning bush. He went back to Egypt to deliver God's message, and then the, the Israelite nation escaped bondage and took this path back to that same area. And you'll notice here that the mountain marked on this map as Mount Sinai is a mountain in Arabia called Jebel El Laws. And this, you may have heard of this, um, it's pretty well known now. There is a traditional Mount Sinai that's recognized by the Catholic Church that is not, I don't think it is the right Mount Sinai at all. But Jebel El Laws in Arabia seems to be the correct site of Mount Sinai. It is where, in the area where Moses would have seen the burning bush in Midian, and then it makes sense of this journey through the wilderness that the Israelites started over here in Egypt, uh, and then they, as they escaped, they came here to the uh, to the Red Sea, and and of course, you know it it. Um, I think on this map it looks quite small that, you know, if they crossed the Red Sea here, that oh, it looks like such a small little crossing. Well, these areas down here are are very, very wide, and, and it's deceptive on the map. This is actually a pretty wide crossing at this point uh, up here. So don't be deceived by that. Also, don't think that... Um, 4,000 years ago or more that the topology, the landscape of this part of the Red Sea was the same as it is now. Okay, so we can't assume that either. Uh, and there have been men that have gone over and researched this area and found Egyptian chariot wheels and parts and armor and all sorts of things that look like there could have possibly been this event of the crossing of the Red Sea at that location. And so it is not out of the realm of possibility. It's actually quite well evidenced, uh, as much evidence as we could expect to find after 4,000 years, right? Uh, and this being their path, they travel through the wilderness. This may not be the exact path, but then, you know, assuming here uh, that this Gulf of Aqaba at the time was not uh, full of water, or they could have gone around. We don't know. This is all speculation. It's all detail that we can't get because the time past has, has been so long. But I'm going to show you pictures now, real quick, of this Mount Sinai, Jebel El Laws. It's pretty amazing and compelling what has been found at that location. For instance, this is the top of a mountain there in that exact location. And this is the one they consider Mount Sinai because the top of it is burnt. It has it essentially blackened coal across the top of the mountain. It's the only one in the area that looks like this at all. There's no other indication of any burning or blackness like this. And so that's an interesting correlation to the fact that God may have rested on this mountain and burned the top of the mountain because of the heat of his presence. And so that is a that is a fact. It is like that. Uh, there's multiple pictures online of this mountain that show this. 
There's also in the same location just near this mountain is this rock, which if you remember the story later in Exodus where the Israelites are in the wilderness near the mountain, they grumble because there's no water. God tells Moses to hit this rock with his staff and that it splits and water comes forth so the Israelites have water to drink. Now the interesting thing about this rock is not only that it looks like it kind of split down the middle, but there is evidence at the base and down this mountain of this rock of water flowing. It doesn't now, but there is evidence that there's water erosion all the way down from where that rock is split. And that's just another interesting piece of evidence that you can, you know, it kind of points to the fact this seems like the right location. And by the way, the traditional Mount Sinai location, if you look that up, has none of these signs, none of them. Uh, and, and at this location at Jebel El Laws, there has been all these different things found. And I'm trying to get it to show you larger. There we go. So you can see there's just tons of different things. The rock that was split. There's different constructions of stacked rock that look like altars. Uh, there are carvings on one of these rocks of bulls, which, you know, cattle would have been the sacrificial animal. Remember when they made the golden calf? It was at the foot of Mount Sinai. So perhaps they were carving graven images also while they were preparing for this worship of this golden calf. But there's just so much at this mountain. And by the way, the government in Arabia has prevented people now from going to this location. They don't want you to see it. They don't want people to take pictures. They don't want people to get close anymore. Back in the 80s, I think people snuck onto this property and took all these pictures and stuff. Um, it's just compelling evidence. It's compelling. So I just wanted you to see that. I've, I've enjoyed learning about that location for a long time. Uh, I encourage you to also seek out information on Jebel El Laws, the probable actual location of Mount Sinai and where the uh, narrative of Exodus 3 most likely occurred, where Moses sees the burning bush. So let's do this now. Let's start looking at... I've put this document together. We're going to go through the passage together. I've highlighted things and I can show you now uh, for each of these instances where it says God or Lord or even angel, we're going to see the words behind those words in the original languages. So I'm taking the mostly focused on the Hebrew behind these words but also just giving you the Greek so you see how it was translated into Greek. This is the Septuagint Greek words. I'm using the Septuagint intentionally because it was the uh, professed, it was regarded as the de facto standard of the best translation at the time of Christ from the original Hebrew texts. And it was done by Jews into Greek. So they probably had the best knowledge of those Hebrew words. But anyway, so I'm giving you both here so we can look through and talk through these different usages of the word God, etc. So let's start reading through here. Exodus 3, verse 1. You can follow along in your scripture. But I'll just read through it. I'll try not to be too long here, but... Uh, Verse 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So the word God here, as you can see, it's highlighted for us, but the Hebrew there is Ha Elohim, and you can see the Hebrew text there, which you may or may not care about, but I just put it for my you know, uh, help there. And the Greek used here is Theu which is a very common usage that's translated to God in the New Testament uh, because obviously the New Testament documents were written by people who knew Greek and spoke it fluently at that time. Uh, so it's interesting that's the same word used but realize that the Greek word theu it doesn't it doesn't have the exact same meaning as God to us. When we say the word God we're thinking of the God of the Hebrews, right? The word theu in Greek means deity, 
they used it for the titans, the Greek gods. They used it for the emperor because they considered themselves gods. They used this word for any supernatural being. And that was what that meaning, the meaning of the word deity is, divinity. Like a supernatural being, quote, higher than a human, a spiritual being, okay? And it's interesting, too, that the Hebrew, Ha Elohim, that's kind of like saying the Elohim. Elohim means, the best way I've ever described it, I think, is spiritual being, okay? So it's similar to Theu, or deity. It means a lot of different things, actually. It can has been used in ancient texts to mean everything from angels to spirits to, you know, ghost-type apparitions to to God himself and angels. It, it, that word Elohim is not specific. So see, that's what I'm saying about it's nuanced, but once you understand what these words mean, you get a better reading of the text because you're understanding then what the writer intended. He didn't, when he wrote Elohim, he didn't necessarily mean specifically just God, Yahweh, okay? Uh, but sometimes he did, okay? That's the context telling you whether that word in the context is talking about God, the, the Elohim God, Yahweh, or another Elohim, because angels were also considered Elohim. So let's think about that. It says in verse 1 there, he came to the mountain of the Elohim. Now, Elohim is a plural form of a word. Uh, pretty much most Hebrew words that end in im are plurals, okay? Um, and so it's just interesting to think of it that way. Perhaps, and, and this is again one of those things where I'm not going to come down hard and say that I know for sure, but it is possible, even maybe likely, that this was considered a mountain of Elohim like a mountain where Elohim were known to be seen. Spirits, angels, it was, supernat it was a supernatural place. I'm just saying, we need to uh, consider that when we read through some of these ancient, ancient passages. Exodus being one of the most ancient passages in the scripture. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So in this verse 2, angel of the Lord, angel is the Hebrew word malak, which means messenger, okay? And the Greek word is angelos, or also meaning messenger, but with a spiritual overtone. So it was obvious that this was a man and angel, okay? Um, but just recognize the wording and what, the way it is. Angels were seen as messengers. That's why this word was used. It's, you think of it as like an emissary of God. And now this, uh, this usage of the word Lord, in most Bibles that's in all caps, is the Hebrew word YHWH, the Tetragrammaton. And I, I'll just always say Yahweh, okay, because that's kind of an alliteration, a transliteration of that word. Uh, so I'm going to say that's Yahweh, and the Greek word there used is kurios, or kurio. And that word in Greek, interestingly enough, only means master. It really means Lord. So it, to me, it's interesting that in the Greek New Testament and in the Septuagint, they did not use the name of Yahweh, which is in the Hebrew. You know, and I can't answer why that is. Maybe that's because, as you know of modern Jews, they don't say God's name. They say Hashem. They say the name when they're referring to God because they don't want to use his name. Um, which I think is interesting. Uh, I don't see it commanded anywhere in Scripture for you not to use the name of God. Okay, so that to me is not an issue. Perhaps that was a Midrashic teaching by their rabbis that they should refrain from using God's name. I don't know. But perhaps that's why the Greek reads Kyriou and the Hebrew uses the Tetragrammaton, the name of God, Yahweh. 
Verse 3, Moses said, I will turn now aside and see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. i got to make sure I keep the text above my head. Sorry about that. I'm blocking a little bit. So verse 4, when the Lord saw that, saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Now, again, this is going to give us a little insight here. The, the capital Lord is Yahweh or Greek kurio. And then the word God here is Elohim. And it's not the Elohim, it's Elohim. When he turned, when the Lord saw, when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called to him out of the midst of the bush. Now, it's interesting. So we have to wonder, and I've wondered this as I've come through this passage. I'm not going to tell you that I know for sure. But it almost seems like this, in verse 2, this angel of the Lord, the Malak of Yahweh, all right, is possibly working and appearing to Moses, but that God is also speaking in the situation. Like there's two characters here. It's not just God in the bush. God didn't necessarily go in the bush, but perhaps one of his angels is making the bush on fire. And God is also speaking. So we have to, again, it's such a nuance, but it helps you kind of understand the way that the Hebrews thought about Elohim, spirit beings. They were frightened of them. Uh, and we're going to see that in a second, that Moses is frightened. But um, it's just interesting. It gives us a little more insight, things to consider and really ponder, okay, think about. Uh, and it's going to get more and more interesting as we go, the way God talks about himself. So let's continue here. Uh, he said, God said then, or Elohim said, Draw not hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon you stand is holy ground. Verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, this is an interesting verse, and this is going to be repeated again and again. When he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he's using a term called, in Hebrew, Elohe. Now, I believe this is most likely the singular form of the word Elohim. So he's saying, I am the, the singular Elohim of your father. Of all the spirit beings, I'm the one of your father. I'm the one of Abraham. I'm the Eloche of Isaac. The Eloche of Jacob, Yahob. Okay? So the way it reads in, in Hebrew is, I am the Eloche of your father. I'm Eloche Abraham. I am Eloche Isaac. Eloche Yaakov. It's very neat to read it and think about it in the way it was said. Okay? And then it says, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Well, is he afraid to look upon God, Yahweh? Or is it like the Hebrew is saying here, he's afraid to look upon Elohim? Because that's the word used. He was afraid to look upon Elohim, spiritual beings, angels, whatever. He was afraid. Okay? So it's just really interesting to break apart these words. Gives us a little insight on how they felt. They were scared of spiritual beings. They saw this mountain as a place of Elohim, and it was scary to them. But he saw this bush that was on fire because of the Elohim, possibly this Malak of Yahweh, this angel of Yahweh's. And he had to turn and see it. He wanted to know what it was, but he was scared because Elohim are scary to the Israelites, to these people. Verse 7, And the Lord said, Lord caps, meaning Yahweh, And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now this word Egypt is another one we need to understand. If you look in the Hebrew, now in Greek, it is Egyptu, okay? So it's Egypt, the word Egypt. Now, I think that that was a word that was used at the time of Christ and the Septuagint, the translation of the Septuagint, for that land, for the land we call Egypt. 
But in the Hebrew, the most ancient text, it's the word Mizraim, okay, in Hebrew. It's not Egypt. Now, we could probably have a whole other video of discussion on this, but when I take these passages and I realize that every reference to Egypt is Mizraim, and then I think about the texts in, for instance, the prophets like Ezekiel about the judgments to come on Mizraim, the judgments to come on Mizraim bringing it down like a man to earth to destroy him. It, it To me, this is a word, Mizraim, that's used to reference the spiritual deity of the nation of Egypt, okay? The spiritual deity above the Pharaoh. Because if you've seen my other videos, you've studied possibly things about the Elohim or the, uh, the shepherding angels that were put over the nations at the time of the Tower of Babel, you know that every nation on earth has a spiritual principality that is over it. And I believe Mizraim may actually be the name of the principality over Egypt. And, and this study of this passage is what kind of has revealed that to me, along with what I said about the prophets. Because the Hebrew here reads not of, you know, it says here in verse 7, I've seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. But the Hebrew actually, if you examine the pronouns, the, the uh, prepositions, it's really of my people which are with Mizraim. That pronoun in or with or on, it's more ambiguous in the Hebrew. And it can just mean with Mizraim. And, and by the way, Mizraim in all the scholarly texts that I've looked at is always referenced in the singular. So that again lends credence to the idea that Mizraim was the spiritual principality of that nation. Okay, So the Lord says, I have seen the affliction of my people that are in or with Mizraim, that are among Mizraim and his nation. Verse 8, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up into a land a good land and large, land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So again, our word Egyptians here, I'll just say it, you know, in the English it is plural, but in the Hebrew it is not. It is the singular name Mizraim. All right? That same exact construction of the word that was in the previous verse. So even though the Translators that did the English translation thought that it was talking about a nation of peoples. I truly believe the Hebrew was referring to this principality. And it says, in the Hebrew, this phrase is, out of the hand of the Egyptians turns into miyad Mizraim, out of the hand of Mizraim. It's not out of the hand of some people. It's out of the hand of the principality of that nation. God was through those plagues, breaking the hold of this principality over his people and forcing him, not the Pharaoh necessarily, but forcing this principality to release his people, Israel. I just realized, I think my head was in the way, but I hope you're reading along in your own Bible. There's verse 8 there. Deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Egyptians being Hebrew Mizraim, and out of the hands of Mizraim is what it really says in the Hebrew. So verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. And again, the Egyptians oppress them, that phrase is Mizraim lochasim otam, the oppression with which Mizraim oppressed them. So singular Mizraim oppressed his people. This is the nation principality of the nation of Egypt. Ten, verse 10, Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou may bring us forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? God here 
Moses said unto the Elohim, all right, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Now, this is an interesting word. Hebrew Pharaoh, it's really almost the same word. And I think that in the English translation, they transliterated that straight from Hebrew. Uh, and in the Greek also, because you can see the Greek there is Pharaoh. But the Hebrew paro is the word underlying that Pharaoh there. And it's really an, there's an, it's an unknown origin. We do not know the origin of this word. No scholar does. They've looked in other languages. They can't find the origin for this word, paro. But it apparently is what the human king of the nation was called. Okay, because we've already uh, supposed that this Mizraim was the principality, that this Pero, this Pharaoh, would have been subservient to, the second in command under the spiritual principality, the human king, ruler. And then the word Egypt here, again, is the exact same construction as the other places. It's Mizraim, singular. In Greek, it's Egyptu, and that's why it's translated Egypt in the English. Verse 12, And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, or Mizraim, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And again, the, the construction in the Hebrew allows for Egypt as Mizraim as a singular, and it's bringing the people away from. It's not, out of is a very specific English translation of a more ambiguous, again, ambiguous prepositional phrase in Hebrew, okay? So it allows for the, the way this could be translated as when you have brought the people from Mizraim away from this principality that has oppressed them. Verse 13, And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, you say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. What shall I say is his name? What shall I say unto them? So in this passage, it's, it's, this is one of the, a perfect example. Verse 13, The word God is used twice. And in both cases, it's a different construction in the Hebrew. The first God here is Ha Elohim. And then the second God here is Elohe. All right, so that's like, the, I said, it's like the singular of Elohim. So Moses said unto the Elohim, which perhaps that's the Malach in the bush, because Moses may be speaking to the bush, but then God also speaking. Or perhaps God is speaking through this Elohim to, to Moses. But Moses said to the Elohim, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, Eloche of your fathers has sent me to you. So Moses is going to go to them and say, the Eloche or Elohim that is the one your fathers worshipped has sent me to you. Your fathers, meaning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Verse 14. And this is a very important passage to most people. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now, the reality is that I am that I am is a pretty good translation of this phrase. But I wanted to bring a little detail to that. The Hebrew is aye, aser, aye. Uh, and there's the Hebrew words for you. But it's, it's really this, it's called the qualitative imperfect uh, form of this verb, a ye or a year, and it is imperfect, meaning it's ongoing and and hasn't been completed. It's it's the the act of existing is what is being referenced in that the act of being, and so I am that I am is a pretty good. I think it's a good representation, but that to me doesn't really. Uh, explain or give you the sense of ongoingness that like I exist that I exist or I 
I am being that I am being is what is what I think of in my head when I'm trying to translate those words, okay? And and get that imperfect sense like it's constant and it's ongoing. I am the being that is being forever essentially. In the Greek this is translated in the Septuagint as uh eu aimi which is I am the being. Okay, that's all that's said in the Greek in the Septuagint. But I think that still the I am that I am is good, but it's like I am existing that I am existing is what God is saying. And he says, uh, I am is the one that has sent me to you for this, the being, the one being. Uh, and in fact, one of my favorite translations, the Apostolic Bible Polyglot says exactly that. It says the one being. Very interesting. Verse 15, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So in this verse 15, there's three different usages. Uh, the first, God, it says, And Elohim said moreover to Moses, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel. Then that the Lord God of your fathers. Now this is interesting. This is the first time we've seen this usage, Lord God together. And in the Hebrew, that is Yahweh Elohe. So he's saying, he's saying he's an Elohim, one of the Elohim, but he is Yahweh. Also, he's giving his name. I am Yahweh Elohe of your fathers. The Eloche of Abraham, Eloche of God, or of Isaac, the Eloche of Jacob. So you see now why this Elohim word is important to understand. It's not the same as our word God. He's saying, I am the spiritual being that your fathers worshipped. I am the spiritual being of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My name is Yahweh, he's saying. And, and over the next 400 years and, and the exodus and the miracles and the plagues, God is going to prove he's the highest of all gods to these people. And that's one thing that I want you guys to understand. This understanding of the Hebrew doesn't diminish God in any way. Um, that's one of the points I really want to make. So um, let me look down through here. I think that we've about nailed this thing. I, I'm going to make these documents available on my blog so that will be something you can grab and you can see I go on all the way through chapter 3 and I even go into chapter 4 to continue I, I just studied on through because it seemed very interesting and, and kept going with the same things happening but uh, you have to grapple with this interplay between the Hebrew understanding of spiritual beings called Elohim and who God was. He was considered an Elohim, one of the myriad of Elohim, but he was the, the creator. He was the one, the being of being, the, the, the highest, okay? So there's nothing here that diminishes that. Um, but I will make these documents available online. I will also make this document, which is the same thing, but I have translated on the right you can see that I have translated the verse according to what I am seeing in the Hebrew. Okay, so I'm taking what we've seen in the words God, angel, Lord. I've meshed that into a translation that I have made now of chapters 3 and uh, most of 4 um, based on the Hebrew. And so I think that that will help you see my perspective and understanding of those texts. Uh, it also kind of literalizes a lot of the Hebrew, I think a little better than most of our, some of our English translations do. Uh, and, and there's a lot borrowed there. If you read and combo the King James, rather than New King James, probably with the NASB, New American Standard, you probably see a lot of the same things in a way. But, but again, that word God is really hard. It's deceptive. Uh, it just masks the true meaning of the Hebrew, okay? So I will make this stuff available for you guys on my blog. Uh, and then one thing I wanted to mention, I, I just want to reiterate that point that, you know, this understanding of Elohim, the principalities, that 
you know, when the Israelites of the Hebrews and these ancient people saw God as one of many Elohim, that doesn't mean they were all the same, okay? It, it doesn't mean that at all. It's just that the word Elohim, we would, if we really translated that purely into English, it would be spiritual being. Any spiritual being is an Elohim. So God is obviously one of those. He's spiritual. Uh, it says in another part of the Bible, God is spirit. So this just helps our understanding of the Hebrew when they were talking about it. And some of these ancient texts in Genesis, Exodus, where this word is used a lot, our translation of English that just uses the word God makes us think it's always talking and referring specifically to Yahweh when it's not, okay? And so we have to, we really have to understand that. And, and understanding that does not in any way diminish our view of God. It should not. It doesn't mean that he's the same as the angels or the same as the spirits or the ghosts or the demons or any of that. It doesn't diminish his power or his presence or any of his attributes. All it does is it simply makes clear to us the way the Hebrew language talks about these matters, talks about these things. And understanding that construction will help us get the meaning of the passages better, okay? And how ancient Hebrews like Moses referred to these spiritual beings of which God was one. And we cannot forget other parts of the scripture that say there is no God like Jehovah, okay? Or that he is the most high Elohim. He's the most high of all. And, and that's repeated again and again. So, like I'm saying, I'm not diminishing in any way that God is who he said he was. It's just we have to understand these languages to get the correct reading of each text. And, and as you saw, when we do that with Hebrews, or excuse me, uh, Exodus chapter 3, it seems that there may have been an angel there providing the visual and interaction with Moses, but that God was speaking through this angel uh, or in addition to the angel. It just appears that that is the case. Uh, and then an understanding there of, of Mizraim, this Egyptian principality, the spiritual being that was over Egypt. Some of those things won't come out unless we can get into these languages. I hope that, that some of that nuance is not lost on you guys uh, with this video. I think that, to me, this just expands my understanding. Uh, and again, I don't have everything perfect, but man... When we work at it like this, God's going to reveal things to us, okay? Because he rewards those who diligently seek him, right? And uh, I've already made the point then about these documents. I'll get them online on my blog for you. I think that's all we're going to do today. Uh, I hope this has been enlightening and shown you a little more about how Hebrew interplays with English. Uh, to me, that's critical to understanding some of these ancient, ancient passages and understanding what happened to the patriarchs. Uh, this helps with my understanding and perspective on Genesis and what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. These things, being able to examine the languages a little tighter, a little more, um, and you can do exactly what I've done on, I, I use biblehub.com, it has a great Hebrew interlinear, and so you can see the English with the Hebrew written right above it, and you can click on the Strong's number right there and open a new screen and look at the Strong's definition of the word. And you can get generally to the same understanding that I have. And you can see what's behind each of those words. And I'll just tell you, after years of doing that for myself, I've started to get a very good understanding of how Hebrew works, how Greek works, how it's different than English. All right? So... I hope this is helpful and exciting in expanding our knowledge on the Hebrew behind some of the ancient texts. Thank you for joining me, and God bless you all. Uh, may he strengthen you in this war that's going on against humanity and keep you and your families safe. Be smart out there. God bless.